okay i let's say i agree with you that war is rare yeah. okay I'll, I'll i'll ride with you for that we're one. just not the norm sure, sure. Just yeah. Get there. yeah okay so not the norm and i that makes sense like it seems crazy because when you get all the media your brain gets distorted but then you say it's extremely costly yeah i'm like it seems like it's mostly costly for the side that loses you know if you win the war then there's a great bounty you can go yeah. get oil back in the day you can get resources you can get land like it seems like in all the wars that people win mm -hmm. it's worth doing <clears throat> and they had a really great reason like you know you and i are fighting over some type of precious commodity if yeah. i kill you and everyone you know I get to have it and then that's going to make it worth it even if i lose you know some percentage of my men yeah i mean so sun Tzu, this famous chinese general who writes this volume 2500 years ago mm -hmm. he has this famous line he says there's no war from which a country is benefited and yeah, it seems crazy it just so individuals benefit sometimes right mm -hmm. so so uh it's true that here's the thing like basically okay suppose you win the war Suppose you're fighting over an oil field or a territory and mm -hmm. you win the war and you were fighting about somebody, you were fighting against someone who is, uh, you guys are basically evenly matched, right? So we both have an even chance of winning this war. Um, you had a choice. You said, okay, we could just split the oil down the middle. I'll take half, you take half because in rough proportion to our mutual ability to burn the house down. Mm-hmm. Or we can fight over it. I can spend an enormous amount of money and then I flip a coin for whether or not I get the oil or you get the oil. Mm -hmm. All right. And so it's like, okay, I can either split the whole thing down the middle or we can destroy a share of it and then flip a coin for it. And and so that's that's the choice. That's the basic choice every time. And uh, And it's almost always better to just split it down the middle before you because because if or i can flip a coin for a damaged pie like in economics we'd call that expected value like the expected value of a coin flip for a shrunken thing is is lower value than actually a 50 percent chance which is also a coin flip of the unbroken thing that makes sense so if i i can get 50 percent, which maybe that's 100 million dollars of yeah. oil or something or i can spend 200 million dollars yeah, exactly to get you know uh, I'd like $200 million of oil. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, oh, it's a wash. Like you spend yeah, all yeah. this money to get, and then if, if you spend $300 million, yeah. then you're losing money to get but $200 even million. Just, even if you had to spend $10 million to get a 50% chance at the $200 million of oil, it doesn't work out. Like it just doesn't, it's just a bad, it's that like going sense. to Vegas and the house always wins. Right. But now this right. is the assumption that the two sides are a coin flip. Right. No, but so, but even let's say now I'm the superpower, I'm, and that's I'm Russia versus Ukraine or I'm like the huge gang versus the little gang. Mm -hmm. And I have 80 percent of the guns and 80 percent of the economic might. And you have 20 percent. It doesn't feel like a coin flip. Right. It's not a coin flip. So now I say, oh, now the choice is I want 80 percent of that. I want 80 percent of the oil and you get 20 percent. Oh. And uh, or we could fight over it. And we both spend money to fight over it. And then I have it with an 80% chance. Like the the basic thing is, is like, it's just easier to split it before we damage it. Because uh, then I'm basically just taking a gamble. The gamble might be more in my favor, but I'm still gambling for something that's now broken. So due to the nature of leverage, yeah. my, my negotiating and like bargaining power is dependent on my force. And yeah. so I will proportionally get that in a deal regardless. So exactly. So think about... Uh, that makes sense. Think about every... Okay, we write books about all the revolutions where all the people rise up against the dictator. Most people don't do that. Most of the oppressed do not revolt. Um, Russians have not risen up against Putin, mm -hmm. right? Putin has 80 or 90% of the power. The Russian people have 10 or 20%. So they get a little bit, but they basically acquiesce. And that's the sad... So there's nothing just about peace. and There's nothing equal, right? The, the mighty get their way most of the time because most oppressed people don't revolt hmm. and and they don't revolt because it's too costly and so and this is just the story through human history and now occasionally hmm. we do revolt we have revolutions we have riotous rebellions some of them are peaceful many of them are not so but this, most of the time we don't do that the same dynamics that are happening with intra-country are happening intra-country with yeah. the leaders and their constituency the iranians might be protesting but they're not violently there's no armed rebellion mm -hmm. there's no armed rebellion in china there's no armed rebellion in russia these are all examples of a powerful clique having 80 or 90 percent of the power and then people 
quietly acquiesce because that's the uh, the tragic, unjust, but natural thing to do in the face of this like threat of destruction. And when you're talking about power, you're talking about like military force that military economic force just the ability to propaganda because like, i'm thinking like millions of people obviously yeah. have more power than one guy yeah but that one guy has a military at his behest and economic forces and other things that he can sort of yeah. exert on his people and you know i'm not the russia expert i you know down the hall i have a russia expert and a ukraine expert they keep me honest uh, <laughs> call them up right now exactly Let's go. exactly and um <laughs> you know what 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 putin's genius his evil genius has been to like fragment opposition you have all these oligarchs mm -hmm. and be like where the heck are the oligarchs they own all these companies they have this wealth they're losing money uh i mean russia you talk about cost of war Russia has set itself back. Its economy has like shrunk almost by half, I think. Yep. It set itself back one or two stages of industrialization. And that's like, that's not like a US intelligence report. That's actually a report from the Russian central, the governor of the central bank. Like that's their own admission. Mm -hmm. Like we are just set 30 years back. Maybe it's even worse than that. And, and it's getting sure. worse. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's so all these people who are just losing all this money from the ordinary people to oligarchs yeah you're getting your yacht seized yeah, yeah, yeah. The, like no, no one wants this so why aren't they phoning him up and saying cut this out because that's what would happen his genius was he fragmented all those people and how he, do you fragment all the people with money well he just i think he kept them i don't know actually it's a good question people mm -hmm. should i'm sure someone has a better answer you could have someone on this podcast <laughs> somehow he has managed to like keep them from collectively organizing sure so that's like a whole so not only so military power the number of guns you have matters mm -hmm. economic might matters but social mobilization your ability to actually like collectively organize is a source of power right and so so when when a group in society learns how to use Facebook or social media to mobilize on the streets. It's like an Arab Spring situation. Exactly. That's all of a sudden now you're in a position to negotiate a better deal. And that's what happened. The Arab Spring was like, aha, we're going to, we figured something out. We want to negotiate a different deal. We're still going to be kind of oppressed. Like mm -hmm. a lot of these are still autocracies, but we're going to demand a little bit more freedom and you're going to give it to us because it's easier to concede it makes more sense to concede than to than to than to fight us for it so this is i don't want to become a conspiracy theorist yes. but if i'm a ruler i'm like yeah. oh it is at my benefit to have my constituency fragmented of course and not working together there's and so, no conspiracy theory about it that is like but i'm like literally the dictator's handbook but i'm looking at america and i'm like yeah. obviously we don't necessarily have a dictator you know we have a yeah. president we have a whole you know governmental system but yeah is it possible that it is at their benefit to potentially stoke a racial issue or yeah. potentially stoke a class issue yeah. or create any of these sort of, you know, uh, socially cultured, you know, issues within society to then have people not be able to collectivize? So that is exactly what I don't know. We'd call them like political entrepreneurs, recent economic entrepreneurs, but political entrepreneurs are constantly trying to like do that sort of stoke the rage machine. Um, in political science, some people call it the, 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 the institutionalized riot machine. Mm -hmm. Like you just want to constantly keep people a little bit angry and full of loathing and hatred and poisonous views towards the other side so that when you need them, you can mobilize them to either come out and vote or maybe do something more nefarious. Right. And, and, and that's kind of like the genius of the founders of the American Republic, which is they were, they were like, completely aware of this they just spent all of their time worrying about the ways that somebody could come in and do this so they made it they did everything possible to make it impossible to uh to actually take over anything or get anything done as a dictator so they 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 devolved power to the states they 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 didn't even have a real president for the first i don't know five or ten years of the republic until they were like oh i guess we need somebody at the executive they right. just so all the political dysfunction in this country and the inability to get anything done is by design because they're like, if we, if the problem with getting things done like hmm. easily is that then that same person can not do what you can, you call it a conspiracy theory. That's just like the playbook, <laughs> right? It's just the normal playbook and they try it. So like, like so many, uh, leaders try this out and then they only get so far because they stretch the limits of what they can do because 
we've constructed this system that's almost impossible to hijack. I see. So the framers are trying to prevent tyranny. And so yeah. they're like, let's create as many like compartments and sort of roadblocks exactly. to getting things done. Right. To prevent a tyrant from coming in and just like getting this whole thing going and crazy. And whipping up these animal spirits and right. pitting group A against group B. Like, let's just make that really hard. It's still possible. Like people. Right. Um, but it just takes a lot of compliance and organization. And I guess the downside of that is now, you know, if you don't have a tyrant, so to speak, it is just harder to collectivize and get regular things done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I think like, you know, one of the, towards the end of the book, like one of the meta reasons I think that we fight is that places find the, are people that are run by tyrants, people where there aren't places where there aren't checks and balances are really, really fragile and um and i would say this is like the one country on the planet where i'd say is too checked and balanced we could be like 10 percent interesting like less checked and balanced and we'd probably be better off huh uh but i mean you and i are both originally canadian right right like that's a funny case where actually you there's no there's actually not a lot of checks and balances officially there's a prime minister who has a majority in parliament it basically gets to make policy just is like an elected dictator for five years, four years, your five year, whatever the term will be. Um, that's not totally true. There's lots of informal checks, but like it's actually that's a country works pretty well in many ways. Uh, it's still checked, but it's not as dysfunctional, I think, some ways as the United States because it's just like maybe not so restrained. 